Women's International League for Peace and Freedom show, The Wake Up Call on WCOM LP, Chapel Hill and Carver, 103.5 on your FM dial, or live streaming at WCOMFM.org. You can also watch the show on the People's Channel after a week's delay on Thursday night at 10 p.m., Friday morning at 6 a.m., or Tuesday at noon. The show will also be available on our YouTube channel, Wolf Wake Up Call. I'm Ira Schwinzer here with our host, Lori Hoyt, and Emily O'Hare on the camera. Today our special guest is Tom Hogan. Welcome, Tom. Welcome. Well, I mean, I'm glad to be here on this uh, unusually warm February day. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're probably about 50 degrees warmer than we were last week at this time. That much, I know. It's almost too much. It's, it's, too, much, it's too much variation. There's too many weather swings. The other thing I was going to mention, uh, I told you before, is that Chicago basically went 100 degrees in about a week, from like 30 below to 70. So that's the kind of weather extremes we're seeing. Wow, that's, that's incredible. That's, of course, a symptom of what we're here to talk about, which is climate change. Yes, it is. There is uh, pretty much conclusive scientific evidence that it's occurring. And there is conclusive scientific evidence that people cause it. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I'm just saying tomorrow it's supposed to get up, I think, 79, close to 80, and then um, Friday night it's supposed to be going down around 30, so we're not having a 100 degree bounce, but we're still bouncing. Oh, we're still bouncing, and there's and, just, uh, you know, that, that was a, I guess they called it a polar vortex coming down from Canada that hit the uh, upper Midwest yeah. and so on, but there's really no reason to not believe that that is probably related, you know, the jet streams and so on to... Uh, the changing climate. So, yeah. You know, somebody might, uh, somebody as you may recall, our uh, denier in chief uh, made a very interesting comment uh, on one of his uh, tweets where he said, uh, "Record colds in the Midwest. Where's some of that good old global warming when we need it? Come back." So uh, yeah, it's yeah. A, <laughs> kind of a short-term thinking. And one of the things I like to point out to people is that, you know, you can say, "Oh my gosh, this is really cold." You know, it's a cold winter, or you can bring a snowball into the Senate and say, you know, can you believe it? Can you believe in global warming? I just made this outside. Well, the thing is, there's a difference, which I think is a good thing to talk about at first. I, I think so, because since we started out calling it global uh, climate warming, then that confused it for a lot of people. So when it'd be real cold, they said, see, this is one of the coldest winters. And I think that's good. I think people are beginning to know the difference because we're sort of changing some of our terminology. Well, we are, and I think... Uh, and that helps, but I, I think there's still some confusion. Well, and there's still some negative stigma to the word climate change as well. I mean, the people um, that don't understand it, and what I was going to say is it's important at the beginning to know that there's a big difference between climate and weather. Climate is like our personality, which doesn't really change much from you know, year to year. And then weather is very much like our mood, which can change pretty rapidly uh, with outside circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really um, kind of unintelligent, if you will, to try to say just because the weather is such and such, that means there's no climate change. Mm -hmm. The records show that we've had five of the hottest years on record in the last five years. Wow. So there's, you know, there's some pretty uh, empirical proof for you right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, sure is. So that that's a good way to put it up so that when it's cold, people say, look at it, especially when we had this extremely cold weather this winter, right. you know, then some people who don't quite understand that say, oh, how can you talk about cold? Yeah, so I think that's so important to clear up, and I'm glad you are. Yeah, and it's just, um, I don't want to get too much into a science lesson, but the uh, basic idea behind it is that when we burn fossil fuels, which you probably know are you know ancient plants and ancient you know animals and other things that are buried deep in the ground. When we burn those, we release CO2, carbon dioxide. And everybody says, well, carbon dioxide is not harmful. That's not you know you can't die from too much carbon dioxide. But what that does is it gets trapped in our atmosphere. And what it does is, as the Earth would like to do, it normally radiates heat. And what happens is the CO2 kind of forms a little shield that prevents the heat from escaping out into the uh, broader universe. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening. It's kind of like we're sitting in here today on this beautiful day. We're surrounded by glass, and we all kind of commented on, boy, it's pretty warm in here. And that's what they call the greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like climate 
global warming, uh, you know, in a small scale. Yeah, maybe they should start growing plants in here with, <laughs> to have by the, these windows because vegetables or veg vegetables. vegetables. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that uh, there are, you know, obviously there are greenhouses that people take a lot of advantage of. That's a lot of the reason why we can have fresh fruits and vegetables year round. Of course, we can also import them from Mexico and Peru and you know other places like that. But greenhouses have become a pretty uh, common, uh, you, you know, commonly used technology, if you will, to grow fresh fruits and vegetables. Yeah, a lot of times people want to get them started in the winter, so by the time spring comes, they're ready to plant. Exactly. Yeah, yeah they yeah. they do that, and there certainly a lot of crops that they do that with, especially the high value ones like. Uh, mm -hmm. They might grow in California and so on. Mm -hmm. But the um, one other thing I wanted to tell you about, and you know, we'll talk about a lot of these things, but what makes me most concerned is that scientists, of course, have been looking at this for decades. And just in the last six months or so, the news has come out that says basically everything's happening faster than they predicted. Mm. You know, the temperature's rising faster than they predicted. The oceans are getting hotter faster than they predicted. The ice caps are melting faster than we had predicted, so we really don't have as much time left as we might like to think we do. And um, one of the things, I think one of the more profound statements that uh, President Obama made, the uh, person that believed in climate change and got us into the Paris Agreement, he made a, a statement that I use when I teach students. As he looked at them and he said, you're the first generation to grow up under the influence of climate change, and you're the last generation that's going to be able to do anything about it. Wow. So that kind of puts it into perspective how urgent the, the matter is, and we're probably you know, 10, maybe 20 years behind where we should be in terms of cutting out our fossil fuel usage, and as I'm sure we'll talk about a little more later, there's a lot of uh, politics involved with that. And I. I uh, just taught a class and we used uh, his second movie, we used an inconvenient sequel produced by Al Gore, who has of course become a passionate advocate for, for the environment and for climate. And I have a feeling that if things had turned out a little differently in 2000, like they should have turned out, we'd probably be well on our way towards you know, cleaning, up the, cleaning up the environment and doing something about this global warming. Hopefully we would have, because from what I understand, our military understands that. They do. And they're making plans for all the unrest that there'll be, and that, that they're saying that's one of where we're at the most danger, because there's going to be huge uh, swaths of population that are going to be having to move. They're going to be, because of, especially in the low-lying areas, these island countries, a lot of our cities are on the coastline. Right. And uh, so that it's it's going to be a potentially dangerous time. So there, and I think wasn't it Exxon, one of the big oil companies, um, started their their scientists were telling them about that 20 years ago, and they suppressed the information. E Exxon, maybe it was. Yeah, I think so. I think it was Exxon, and I think it was the um, same company that you know used to be the CEO used to be uh, Tillerson. Mm. the guy that became our Secretary yeah, of State. Yeah. And it actually is true, and I think it's almost from the 70s. So you can yeah. go back from, to there. But yeah, their internal scientists told them, you know, this is coming, we better get prepared for it, we better get ready to, you know, use uh, different kinds of fuel. And it's very reminiscent of what had happened in the 60s when the tobacco industry knew cigarettes were harmful. Yes, and, and suppressed they, And they suppressed that information. And then once the Surgeon General and others got a hold of it, they became pretty good at what you would call the denial industry there. They got enough people who would claim that, oh my gosh, we've got uh, no real proof, there's, you know, no, it's too much uncertainty, we don't really think this is, you know, going to cause you harm. And it's not long before that when you would go and see on TV an ad that said three out of four doctors smoke camels. So they had a fairly significant push to keep you know, cigarettes from being unregulated. Well, it turns out many of the same firms, PR firms and lobbying firms, are using the same tactics with global warming. You know, with funding from the industry, they've been out there uh, trying to put down the science and all they really do in a lot of cases is say, we're not sure. 
Huh. And we're not 100% sure. And science is never 100% sure on anything. But the vast majority of scientists really do uh, feel it's true, say about 97%. Tom, could you explain more about how fossil fuel, the industry, and what they're doing affects climate, climate change? Could you explain yeah, that? Yeah, I sure yeah. will a little bit. I mean, as I mentioned, fossil fuels, which we've come to rely on in all forms, whether it's coal, natural gas, oil, they all are made up of, like I said, sort of you can look at them as prehistoric plant and animal material yeah. that's been trapped in the ground and through pressure has become coal or oil or natural gas. And what they do is they take that out of the ground, they put it in a power plant, we put it in our cars, and we burn it. And interestingly enough, the U.S. puts out about 25 percent of the CO2, the carbon pollution, when we in fact only have about 4 percent of the people. So we're really kind of ground zero for, for that in a lot of ways. And what, as I was saying before, it's the CO2 that gets uh, trapped up in the atmosphere. Now in the old days, I mean before we had you know a lot of industrialization, before we had suburbanization, there's a real good way to get rid of CO2 and it's called plants. So where you had big areas of forest, even in cities now they're starting to plant more forest partly to absorb CO2 but even more importantly I think is to provide shade and they become, because cities are known as heat islands. I don't know if you've ever noticed that but if you once you, you know, if you got a little temperature gauge in your car, if you're driving out in the country and, you know, may say you know, 65 degrees, the minute you get into a black top highway, yeah. it'll jump up 5 or 10 degrees. And so, you know, there's really the CO2. And then as far as the industry goes, I mean, they're, you know, they really don't have any other, I'll say, alternative. You know, they're, right now what they're doing too, which is very uh, sad, is they're taking efforts to suppress the success of solar energy, wind energy, you know, these alternative fuels, which really could do a lot. I think we have enough wind on this planet to probably, you know, 25 times the amount we need to generate electricity for all our uses. Same with solar. You know, we've got a lot of solar, which, you know, has not, it's been well tested, in other words. We know that the price has gone down for a solar panel. We know that it works. The one thing we're kind of waiting on right now are storage batteries. But what had happened for a while, which is kind of pretty good, but I think is even illegal in North Carolina right now, is that the power companies, if you generated s solar at your house, for example, and you had more solar energy than you could use, well, the power companies would buy it back from you or give you credit for it. Mm -hmm. And there have been some attempts, I'm pretty sure they've been successful, to basically say, no, you can't do that. I know there's a big fight in California over it, but the, um, the solar industry is booming. And there's a lot of manufacturing being done of solar technology. Mm. And I bet you can guess where all that's being manufactured. China. They believe it in a real big way because they are building coal-fired plants about as fast as they can. But they're smart enough, I think, to know that that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. But they also know there's a huge market for it, for solar panels, things like that. So they could, it's another example of we developed the technology in the United States, another country, particularly China, gets a hold of it, and they produce it for a fraction of the cost. Well, and, and with a new industry like solar and wind, it takes a while for them to be able to make a profit. And so when cars and, and the, uh, other things are being developed, the government subsidizes, they're still subsidizing well. I think people would be shocked to know how much government money goes into subsidizing these wealthy oil companies. So this new industry needed more help. And when I think Obama tried to have a model plan and it wasn't making a profit because we're in a very extreme capitalist society, they they had to go under where China will, will the government will subsidize to get that new industry going. Mm -hmm. And also knowing it's, 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 a, it's a great boon to be shipping it over to us. Yeah. And it makes it look really good for China that they're in the forefront in some ways of, of, of climate change well, and, and responding to it. And, uh, uh, and we're lagging. I mean, uh, N.C. Warren in this state has been a uh, voice crying in the wilderness for years at Duke Power. 
uh, and Duke Power is making all these grandiose plans to build a, a big power station instead of putting more money into solar. They put the barest minimum that they're required to right. by law. Well, and you mentioned about the subsidies on the uh, oil companies. I yeah. think it's, uh, I don't know if it's really a tragedy, but the real problem right now, and I'm not sure all your listeners will agree with me, but the real problem is our gas is way too cheap. It, you know, it when, sure we can, is. when we can buy gas for $2.15 a gallon, and that's down from like $3, $4 a gallon, usually that doesn't happen to something. Usually it inflates, it goes up in price. But it's a lot of it is due to the government price supports, the government subsidies. Exactly. You know, it's real popular. Oh, look what we're doing. We're paying less for our gas. Well, if you go to Europe, I mean, it's about three or four times as expensive. You know, even, you know, countries that uh, are in the Middle East, I think, charge more for gas. So that's one of the ways. And did you notice uh, some years ago when the price of gas went way up, then people started switching to smaller cars. Right. And that was mm -hmm. in, in sort of a heyday. And then if they've been, I'm sure, politically keeping the price of gas down, because politicians like to, because people complain mm -hmm. when the price goes up. So the politicians love to take credit for that. and. Uh, and now the most popular car is an SUV. Right, and that Which again, is that's horrible. That's you know an effect of some of the lobbying. You know, you've got General Motors, you've got Ford, you've got these hand companies. In hand. They don't really have it together yet. You know, it costs them too much to produce it, to produce an electric car, and they've actually suppressed the production of electric cars. There was a movie quite a while ago about who killed the electric car. Ah, uh, yes. And that was basically the story of you know, the oil companies stepping in there. So they're, again, they're subsidizing. They're, they they're telling government. They bought them up and, and crushed them. These yeah. beautifully perfect yeah. cars. I, remember, I saw that movie or documentary. Yeah. It was horrifying. And some of the companies, I think, like Ford and General Motors and others, have developed electric cars. But as you said, there's really not a whole lot of market for them right now because they cost a little more. They cost more in the initial investment. And so people are saying, gee, why should I? It's a little tiny car. I think I'll go out and buy my SUV or my jumbo pickup truck or something like that. And that's what you're right. That happened almost completely in line with the falling gas prices. Absolutely. Back when it was $4 a gallon, people were, you know, trying to buy electric cars and they weren't around. And Elon Musk, I guess, is the one that's created one that's mm -hmm. actually commercial. But it's, I think, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's a whole lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. But you've got, I think, the Ford Volt. You've got some other cars. I think Ford is even discontinuing that, their electric car. That is, that is scary. Yeah. That is scary. So it's, it really is... Um, talk uh, about heads, heads being buried in the sand. Well, that's yeah, one of the things I do want to talk about is the uh, uh, whole... And it's almost like I was talking about the industry that's out there right now. There's a whole com uh, climate change denial industry that is being subsidized by not only the oil companies, the automotive companies, but there's a whole group of um, lobbying firms. One of them up there is called the Heritage Foundation, I believe, and they are actively trying to organize, trying to find scientists who will speak out. And yeah, that's why they say 97% of the scientists believe in global warming. It's because 3% of them have probably been bought off. You know, and that's what we're seeing is there's an active group of people who are trying to deny climate change. And you know, if you looked at the, the literature about surveys, you know, there have been a lot of studies done over the last 10 years or 15 years about who believes in climate change, who supports measures to eliminate climate change. There's a real clear pattern. And I guess this sort of puts me into that uh, sort of demographic group. But it tends to be older, white men, which is me, but also Republicans. <laughs> and those, they say that climate change is the number one way that you can differentiate a Democrat from a Republican wow. in terms of belief. But interestingly enough, until 2000, the Republicans and the Democrats were going up at the same pace. They were increasing in terms of who believed in it. Mm -hmm. And then right after 2000, as we got an oil man in the White House, they started diverging. So that now there's probably 50 percentage points difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, and you know that's then that's those are the ones that are in power. I mean, we had an interesting uh, State of the Union last night. I mean, there've been a couple things. One comment I 
found very interesting, and it was brought up by the, the speaker afterwards, was that he mentioned nothing about climate change. There was not a word. We heard a lot about the border. We heard a lot about other subjects, but we heard nothing about climate change. But the good news was, is when they turned and pan around the room, you had all these young women in the house. So they're, you know, they're, they're calling something like, they, I think uh, the name they've come up with it is a new green deal. Yes. And that's what they're trying to promote. You know, sort of like what Roosevelt did with the New Deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that just kind of shows you how important the 2020 elections are going to be. Yeah, absolutely. But everybody that's running there is bringing up climate change as a very important issue. Now, again, we've gotten behind by quite a while because Barack Obama had put some very important you know, laws and regulations into effect that would limit the amount of CO2 that could be released into the atmosphere. Actually tried to limit certain kinds of drilling, he was sort of against fracking, you know, didn't want to build the pipeline from Canada. So there was actually a, you know, sort of a pushback against the expansion. And now, of course, partly because he did it, the current president just wants to overturn everything, mm -hmm. including the, uh, the Paris Climate Treaty, which I guess the good news on that is, is I think we can't get out of it until 2021. And we are going to have an election between now and then. So the next president will have an opportunity to keep us in it. But what is encouraging is if you look around, a lot of states are doing something about climate change. Yeah. Matter of fact, Governor Cooper unveiled a really important initiative, which is called Executive Order 80. And with that, he's asked all his cabinet agencies, they've all got to take significant steps to reduce their energy use, to reduce their fuel use, to buy electric cars. I mean, we're talking to the Department of Corrections, we're talking the Department of Transportation. We're not just talking the Department of Environmental Quality. We're talking about all the agencies. And then we can be proud of the fact, I heard this morning, that they're having climate hearings in the Natural Resources Committee in Congress today. And there were two governors speaking at it. One of them was Governor Cooper. Yeah. So we've got some, you know, we've got, we've got some things going on in the state that have been long overdue. Well, but Governor Cooper, while he's doing some good things, uh, many environmentalists are very upset with him mm -hmm. over uh, allowing these uh, pipelines oh, that's, to yeah. go through. And they're trying to crisscross our state from every direction with these. You know, he did stand up about uh, offshore drilling. Right. And, uh, but some people make the point that that uh, a lot of times affects uh, people at the coast with very expensive houses. and and you know, a lot more money in their pocket for campaign uh, donations. Right. But where these pipelines are going through are a lot of in the eastern part of the state, the poorest, most vulnerable people. So he doesn't get a great report card, but I'm glad to hear right. about this other thing that he's doing. I didn't know about that. So I'm, because many of us fought for him to be, right. in, you know, to, to win the office. And uh, so it's really disappointing when you feel he's letting you down. It's such a significant thing as these pipelines, which are absolutely terrible, you know, right. really, and dangerous. Well, they are. They all, they, rupt they, they all rupture at some point. Yeah, There's always exactly. all kinds of accidents. And they're basically, they don't quite use eminent domain, but they really make it tough for a landowner to hang on to their land. When well, they, they are using some eminent some domain. Some eminent domain. And, yeah, the, the whole pipeline issue is, is very... Uh, complex. I mean, because again, we want power. And the pipeline presumably distributes natural gas, which when you get right down to it, is cleaner than coal. It is cleaner than oil. But not getting it up out of the ground with fracking is... No, I know. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, no. so they, they tout, tout, it, tout it as uh, uh, as cleaner, but they don't mention oh, no. about uh, all the methane and getting that, breaking these rocks up and getting getting the uh, gas out of right. the ground and how, how uh, absolutely dangerous that is and about in the wake of places where they've had a lot of them getting earthquakes for the first time. That's right. You know, so it's, it's a, it is, it's, it's complicated, but they, they kind of smooth over some of the unpleasant factors with right. that. Well, and then uh, they have these, uh, where they start up there in the Dakotas and so on, they have these things that basically are boom towns where they started off and they had so many people, largely men, coming up there to work. 
that they built all these hotels, all these restaurants, all these apartments to house these people. And then as soon as the price of oil and gas went down, fracking be did become too expensive. And so they've pretty much abandoned them. Now they may go back to them again at some point. And here in the state, there was some, you know, certainly some major concerns, I think, around Sanford, you know, Lee County down oh, there, yeah. Chatham County. There's a lot of counties pretty much over to the coast where the fracking will take place. And one of the scary things about fracking is how much water they have to yeah. use in order to get the uh, oil out of the ground. Yeah. And then what are they going to do with the water? You know, they're going to probably end up trying to discharge it into our rivers. They're going to maybe you know, spray it on the, on the earth. We don't know quite what they're going to do yet, but they're going to, when they use this water, it comes up really nasty. It's full of all kinds of chemicals, and they won't a lot of times divulge the, yeah, what they won't kind of chemicals they they're using. Although some of it's been found out, and they're highly dangerous, highly, dangerous. highly toxic, cancer-producing, yeah. and and benzene. You know, I can't. Yours probably can remember better than I can some of the the chemicals, but uh, uh, you know it's so yeah. It's it, it's a constant struggle. And yet, in, the, in this state in particular, we're so blessed with so much sun and yeah. so much wind. And I know Jim Hansen, that very well-known uh, scientist, has said this state could easily uh, get just about all of its power between solar and, uh, and wind. Right. You know, we're, we're so fortunately situated. And, uh, but they're doing everything you write, as I said earlier on, to suppress and, and keep the, their, their money supply going and uh, do it. And I, I guess they figure if, if they can keep it going for another five or ten years, you know. Oh, the, well, they'll all be dead and they, gone. To heck, so. with, to heck with what happens to Mother Earth, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's one of the clear problems, and that's why when I went over earlier about some of the characteristics of who denies climate change, mm -hmm. age is a big factor. You know, people mm. over 40, people over 50 are much more likely to deny it because they probably, in fact, won't have to live with the results of it. Yes. And that's why when you talk to students, you talk to young people, they're very concerned about it because they're going to have to live with it. They're going to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. And those of us, I have a young two-year-old grandson right now, and he's going to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah, all of us, I think. I think, you know, the, the way I'm kind of cynical about it, and I try to make this sort of funny, but it really isn't. I'm glad I'm 66, not 16. Yeah. Because we're going to see that dramatic of changes. We're going to see, and we can talk about this a little more, but the impacts of climate change are just now being felt. Yeah, we'll get back to that and back to Tom right now. We're going to take a station break, and then we'll catch our breath and then come back. This is Will's Wake Up Call on WCOMLP, Chapel Hill and Carver, 103.5 FM. You can stream us live at WCOMFM.org. Thanks, Iris. Um, if anybody has any announcements, let me know. But the one thing, this Saturday, the long-awaited HK on J will take place in Raleigh. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning. And... Um, HKMJ for the few people who don't know what that means. H, historic, K stands for thousands, and J for Jones Street, where the legislature is. So historic thousands on Jones Street. We've been doing it for, I don't know, maybe 12, 14 years. And um, Reverend Barber started that this many years ago as a way to get People, uh, you know, so many times they talk about us being in silos, that there's environmental concerns, there's uh, labor concerns, there's peace concerns, that all of this to coalesce in, in one strong movement that can have many separate concerns, but that we're all united to want to get justice in this state. And so, uh, so we've had as many, the one year we had 80,000. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that we don't almost have that many, but we always have uh, some thousand. It's, it's a very good turnout. Mm -hmm. People come in buses, and uh, and uh, some some years the weather is freezing cold. Some years it's not too bad. But we're years. Do, do you know where we're meeting at the beat, to start off? South and Wilmington. South Street and Wilmington. Okay, then they're going to march to Bicentennial Hall. 
uh, and it's just a short march, so uh, everybody's invited, and it's just a wonderful way to see all these other people, uh, um, the, the energy you get knowing you're not alone, that there's a significant number of people who are struggling with you for justice in right. the state and for and one of those things is definitely for the climate. Climate, well, climate justice. Right, you're right on that. And they, uh, yeah. they're finding that the environmental problems, you know, climate change and other things are definitely more hurtful or more harmful to people with lower incomes. You yes, know, usually yeah. they, you know... Anywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. I mean, particularly the U.S. compared to developing countries. But in the U.S., you know, we have some real problems with that. If you look at the flooding, and we can talk a little bit more about the impacts of climate change, but you've got these little communities along the Noose River, you know, the Cape Fear, the Tar River, so on down there, that they get consistently flooded. And then, you know, three times out of the last five years, I believe. So the real question is, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Do we just keep rebuilding those communities? Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are historic. You know, I think there's a historic uh, African-American community. I want to say it's Princeville. It's something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a community down there that's been flooded constantly. And then you've got some of the larger towns that have been sort of bypassed by, uh, let's say, the economic boom that's hit the triangle. Mm -hmm. But you've got Rocky Mount. You've got some of the towns down there. You've got Kinston Goldsboro, was... Kinston. You've got mm -hmm. these towns that just don't have the resources, they don't have the leadership to pick themselves back up. So let me, you know, go back to Governor Cooper for just a minute because he has established a new office of recovery and resilience. It's within the Department of Public Safety and they're really trying to coordinate all the disaster release, the relief, all the planning, all the work that's being done to try to address climate change. And you might have heard I use the word resilience and they're talking about climate mitigation or climate impacts. They're mm -hmm. talking about right now that we're at the point where we better almost assume we're not going to be able to, you know, avoid the mm -hmm. most extreme impacts of climate change and there's a lot of emphasis now on how can we adapt to it, mm -hmm. you know, how can we adjust to it. Mm -hmm. So take for example the cities down there along the rivers, why don't we move them up to higher ground? Mm -hmm. Partly because there's no higher ground down there, you know, it's pretty much, you know, even here in Carboro there's issues with when it floods, you know, people's houses get flooded. Well, the problem there is these houses have been there 20, 25 years, and there was never any real emphasis on not building on the floodplain. But now if you want to buy a home, you want to get insurance, you've got to demonstrate that you've got to, somebody has to determine mm -hmm. that you're not on the floodplain. But that's a little misleading because the floodplains were developed, floodplain maps, I believe, were developed based on what they would call a 100-year storm mm -hmm. or a 50-year storm. Mm -hmm. And we've had, I think, three 500-year storms in the last, I think it's 10 years. So when building those homes, even though it wasn't the most desirable in terms of low-lying, it still wasn't that bad. But in the meantime, we've had so much development, we've cut down so many trees, right. we've created so many more impervious surfaces. Uh, and uh, so that these homes are now 10 times more vulnerable than they were before. And the storms we get are heavier, Much heavier right. you know so that it used to be if you have a gentle rain it's get it's a chance to soak into the ground the runoff this is so bad but you get one of these slashing rains where buckets are dumped within a short time it uh it becomes very dangerous well it really is and i mean the other area which uh, i'd like to talk to you a little bit about which is the same kind of basic problem <clears throat> is the coastline yeah you know we have what's uh one of the impacts of climate change is that, as I mentioned, the ice sheets are melting, Greenland, Iceland, the Arctic, the Antarctic, mm. these are all melting. And what happens is that goes into the water, obviously into the sea, into the ocean. It causes the sea level to rise. I mean, you find that is, is going to be particularly troublesome in some places. I think uh, one of the interesting examples in Al Gore's latest film was Miami Beach. Mm. Now Miami Beach, they get, even without a rainstorm, they've got water coming out of their storm sewers constantly. Wow. And what their sort of silly approach is, I think it is, is they're trying now to elevate all the roads. 
by two or three feet. You know, it doesn't say anything about the houses. And of course, that's Miami Beach where there's a lot of money. But what I've heard, it's, and I think this is true, is that Miami Beach can no longer sell municipal bonds. Nobody will buy their municipal bonds. Insurance companies are shying away from it. You really have, you can't, I think, get more than a 10 year mortgage or 15 year mortgage because that's how sure. And when you mm -hmm. talk about somebody that really would know their stuff, insurance companies mm -hmm. are very concerned about it. And a friend of mine who owns a, a condo as part of a development uh, down on the beach, I think it's in Brunswick County down there, there's only one insurance company left that will provide insurance for coastal homeowners. And I bet it's pretty darn expensive. Well, it is. It's a, I guess I heard it was, I think it's called the Hanover, I believe, and it's owned by Lloyd's of London. So that makes it for a very, uh, uh, you know, it is expensive. Yeah. And, you know, they, uh, so along the shoreline, you know, we're building places where we really shouldn't be building. And again, a lot of that is people say, oh, gee, I want to live near the ocean. I want to live on the river. You know, and everything that sounds fine for a little while until we get the higher floods and the, the sea level rise. And we've got these barrier islands, which if you think about them, they're really not that high off the ground. They're not that far above sea level. And you can have those pretty much flooded over, swamped over by a storm surge pretty easily. And one example that maybe is, uh, I think, quite instructive is that the Outer Banks, where they are right now, 10,000 years ago, they were about 50 to 75 miles out further into the ocean. So they've been migrating, they've been moving and along. And that's what people don't realize, these islands, the natural, even without climate problems, the natural way they are that is that they are, they are constantly, you know, losing sand on the ocean side right. and building it up on the other side. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful scientists, is it Ortho Pinckney, one of... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from Duke, yeah. Yeah, it's been, been, been talking about that for 30, 40 years, and people just don't want to pay attention. They want to, well, let's put some bulwarks, let's... let's yeah, well, the one thing that... Dig up some more sand from somewhere else and build up sand on the beaches, they think that they can hold back nature. Well, it's, it's interesting, they'll give a little bit of credit uh, to North Carolina. Back in the early 70s, they passed something, CAMA, the Coastal Areas Management Act. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that requires is you can't build further towards the ocean than I believe past the second dune. Uh -huh. So you're not allowed to build right on the ocean. Uh -huh. And the other thing they have done is they've banned these things called like breakwaters, mm -hmm. you know, which basically it's a long thing that juts out in the ocean and tries mm -hmm. to you know prevent the water from coming, say, onto Oak Island. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to go further down and swamp Holden Beach. I'm just mm -hmm. using those as examples, but mm -hmm. those are the kind of things that so people are now trying to build these big barriers. Yeah, Topsail Island, they're putting in all these massive boulders and they're putting sandbags and they're trying to hold back the water. Mm. But uh, interesting, and I'm talking with a man that uh, he's from New Orleans, he's, he's an architect, it's pretty phenomenal, people might want to look it up. Yeah. He has something called the Dutch Dialogues and they spent a lot of time going over to Holland to try to figure out what Holland was doing with their water. Yeah. Because it basically the whole country is almost under sea. Yeah, they're pretty expert. About yeah, that. you know, they got the story of Hans you know, Brink, I don't know if that's who it was, but stuck his thumb in the dike, yeah. you know, to hopefully stop it. Well, they changed their whole philosophy on water from one of trying to control and move water to one of living with water. You know, so they decided, where do we want to build? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to apply that in New Orleans right now, you know, as they rebuild New oh, Orleans. Oh, are they in yeah, New Orleans? Yeah, that's where the architect is from. It's called Dutch Dialogues. And they'll basically take an old, terrible-looking, you know, canal, uh -huh. And they'll build up both sides, so you got bike trails, you got things like that, you got nice bridges going over it. They've got some really good plans for how to deal with it. Mm. But of course, New Orleans has a big problem in that the whole city's under sea level. Yeah. I mean, if you ever mm. go down there, you probably may or may not know, but there aren't any graves. Everything has to be an above ground mausoleum in New and Orleans part, because of that. Part mm. of that was there was all those, what do you call like marshland. Oh, right. That was like a sponge, so when the when the ocean was coming in a storm, it had some protection before it actually hit the city, and then they started draining them and building on them. 
So now they don't have right, They don't have that. But the other, I was going to mention the other big problem there is that, you know, when water flows, particularly in a river, it tends to take some of the sediment from the side. It tends to take certainly, you know, cropland erosion, construction erosion, all sends soil sediment into the water. Well, the largest river basin in the country is the Mississippi River Basin. And the Mississippi River empties out right at the end of Louisiana. Mm. And what's happening to a lot of those marshlands is it's not just sea level rise, it's the deposit of the sediment mm. that smothers the plants, gets rid of the fish habitat, gets rid of oysters, you know, so that's a lot of what it is. And there's even a, one example of a community the way I think they spent an awful lot of money but they've moved the whole community like 100 miles. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. Same with New Orleans. You know, Somebody described New Orleans as putting a cereal bowl inside of a big you know, sink full of water. You know, That's kind of mm -hmm. how it's sitting. So again, we probably shouldn't have built there, but back to uh, the, the people doing these, these dialogues. They go into a local area, they talk to the people, they get all the leaders together, they spend a lot of time you know, discussing things, figuring out what they can do. Mm -hmm. And it's already been done pretty effective in the Hampton Roads, Norfolk area. It's being done in Charleston. Mm -hmm. It's being done in Houston, which is another interesting case, which is almost completely below sea level. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking now about uh, that things are changing, but ways to mitigate right. and try to adapt uh, uh, to some of this. Um, but again, you know, can we do it fast enough? I mean, you mentioned the battle reports are coming out um, that are saying it's all happening much faster than we right. thought. One of them was a UN report. I think yeah, it was yeah. a report of our, was it our military? There was some, well, it was a, or, or all the, all the... Um, 13, 13 different agencies, including the military, interior, I think commerce, all those agencies came together and produced this wonderful report. I wrote down the name of it. It was the fourth U.S. climate assessment. And when that came out, one of the big things they talked about And that's there, just in the past year. Yeah, right? that's in the past year. One of the big points they tried to make with that was that the economic impacts are going to be significant. You know, whether it's cropland damage, damage to property. I think they estimate Hurricane Florence caused $17 billion worth of damage mm -hmm. in our state. And if you go to Wilmington right now, they're still at least a couple months ago when I was there, there were still houses that had trees on them. You drive along a street and there were all kinds of tree limbs and things like that piled up. And to show you how short-sighted and sort of mis, uh, uninformed people are, there's been a big push down there lately to cut down trees. Because they said, well, we don't want one of these falling on our house, so let's just get rid of our trees. You know, what does it make it beautiful? You got trees on your property. Mm -hmm. But they're so afraid of these trees crashing mm -hmm. that they're doing that. So that's you know very very short sighted, and you know when you talk about climate change, there are other aspects of it. We often hear about flooding, more extreme storms, but you know last year, you know every summer you hear about these incredible droughts, these incredible heat waves that come through places. I think from what fire. I recall, fire, yeah, wildfires. You've got that, but also I'm not exactly sure, but some Scandinavian countries have experienced their first heat wave ever. And I think places like Seattle, Washington are experiencing yeah. incredibly high heat. Mm -hmm. And you know, so that's really, that's dangerous. We often uh, talk about homeless people mm -hmm. and let's get them out of the street when it's cold. Let's build shelters for them. Let's bring them in so they can get warm. We're now going to have to think about what we can do with them during the summer when there's excessive heat because it's just about as dangerous as extreme cold and you know it does a lot of things so there's human health impacts of all of these diseases well, like, that's, yeah. yeah there's a spread of diseases that used to never affect different parts of the country are moving northward it's changing all our crop patterns there are places in I think believe in Africa primarily but where they've traditionally produced a lot of coffee and now because the climate is changing, the coffee growing regions are slowly moving away from the equator because they got to, you know, move to where the, the climate is, is, uh, is good. And then you get the uh, incredible rainstorms. And I think California is just like the perfect example of that. Boy, oh boy. You have drought, you got everything dry, you've got all this, you know, fuel, if you will, you know, 
pine straw, whatever. You got all these dry leaves, you got everything there that makes it a perfect uh, uh, kindling for a fire. So fires come in, you know, amazingly fast. You know, they destroy communities, they, they kill people. And then they're down in LA, which interestingly enough, actually took out some celebrity houses. I believe Neil Young and a few other people were complaining because it took out, out their houses. And that's the kind of people that need to stand up and talk. Yes. Because actually we trust people. There's a good movie called The Eleventh Hour with Leonardo DiCaprio in it. Oh, yes. Very, very well done. And that's, you know, I think particularly young people. Who are they going to believe? They're going to believe, you know, somebody that they recognize mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, the celebrity culture. But back to California, what happens, particularly down Southern California, what you'll find is that, okay, we have a fire come through that burns off all the vegetation. Then we have these torrential rains, which cause mudslides, and they cause houses to go off their foundation. So, I mean, it's just a really a, a, an incredibly difficult circle when you think about the events. You know, there's just one thing piling on top of another. And really, I think with the, uh, as you mentioned, with the military, one of the interesting things that came up with there was the shipyards, like Norfolk. They're going to basically yeah. have to totally redo that or abandon that yeah. because it's no longer going to be you know, safe for them to be there. Yeah. And so, there, and as, as you mentioned, the idea of climate refugees. That's, that's going to be a big well, issue. I think Look it already how is. Refugees from war or how they're already being treated. And, you know, and I, I can see you get thousands of of people and, and you know, I, I my hats off to Angela Merkel because she really wanted to, to right. do better, and then she's already losing popularity because as as more and more were coming in, the German people didn't didn't like that many people coming in, and uh, and some countries have been heroic. Greece has been heroic, and they also had tremendous fires a few years back, right. and I think Russia, you know, this. California is not the only place we hear about that so so much and so often because it's in our country, but it's just worldwide uh, terrible things happening with with the climate disruption and disrupting the usual patterns of what we expect with with the weather with the right. change of seasons. Yeah. Well, and you know, you mentioned Merkel and you mentioned Germany, and that's an example of a country that's trying to really get their act together. They're trying to yeah. do a lot more with renewable energy. They're trying to phase out coal-powered yes, uh, powered plants. But one of the dilemmas you have here is when you look around at all the different ways we can generate electricity, one that people are actually talking about again is nuclear power. And I think that's going on in France. There's a lot of nuclear power plants. Of course, we've got one here. I think it's an interesting, um, when my family and I moved down here in the late 80s, we lived in Cary, and our biggest fear was, how are we going to get out of here when Sharon Harris blows up? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Sharon Harris, we've just seen the China Syndrome, there have been all mm -hmm. these movies, and we were all convinced that nuclear power was just the worst thing ever. Well, it's got a lot of problems, like what do you do with the waste? You know, and certainly there's some problems, like if you're like the Japanese and you build them right on the seacoast, and you get a tsunami, so on and so forth. But, you know, we've got to look at all these things. I'm not a proponent of nuclear power. We have it, but when you trade it off against coal-fired plants, it doesn't emit any CO2. So yeah, but we, some of these European countries are actually going back to more nuclear power. But you know, even if we said, oh, okay, let's, let, let, we're, we're saying we've got about 10, 12 years that more and more of the effects are hitting us already. Mm -hmm. uh, those plants take, what, how many years to build? Yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, it would be so much more quicker and more efficient to start putting up more solar. wind, more solar. Mm -hmm. You know, they could right away, I mean, when, when they were having a good uh, tax uh, rebate on solar, solar right. that's what helped jumpstart the industry. Mm -hmm. I know. Then the feds and the states started trying to pull back on that, so it's kind of slowed things down a bit. The other hopeful thing, though, is that the batteries have become so much right. cheaper. Right, they'll become cheaper. And I think that if, if the country faced it realistically and then subsidized building our, our, ourselves, that would be building the, the, uh, the windmills, right. building the solar panels. You know, that, the government, that's where they should be putting their money. And and just, that would be much quicker. 
I'll just mention it. You know, again, it's, I've been watching a lot of videos lately about this. There's a, yeah. a, a video out called Carbon Nation, you know, two different words. But at the end, they profile a program in Oakland started by Van Jones, who some of you yeah. may know. He's now yeah. on CNN. He was one of Obama's top advisors. Yes. And what his whole thing there, it's really wonderful, is that he tries to take ex-criminals, he tries to take people who are poor, and they train them how to install solar panels. Oh. And it's a good industry, it's a good living. And you know, just think of all these people that need jobs. Yeah. You can have a whole lot more jobs with solar installation than you can with coal mining. It's a great job, and the jobs that will continue because yeah. those are going to need maintenance. And you could, you know, start off with each town that any new construction's got to have solar, right. and that we're going to put it on all our municipal buildings. That's, I mean, that's they true. could have just, you know, in the Second World War, it's amazing how they could gear up so quickly. Put out a couple of big ships a week. I know. Yeah, yeah, they you could. Because I'm old enough to remember an <laughs> uncle working in. You know, they 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 provided daycare so women could go at Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. Yeah. And uh, you know, so there's ways that the government, if they got on board, could do so much so quickly. Right. Uh, and. And mm -hmm. I, I'm glad that some states are taking the initiative, so we're getting some of the groundwork laid. And uh, you know, and I think that this would be great in community colleges. Oh. Oh, yeah, right, right, that could be that could provide jobs in every town. Yeah, in every town. Well, and, and especially you know, with the need for you know employees and skilled People jobs, like, skilled could, jobs where they could actually make some money, make a decent. And uh, you know, wind energy is, is the other one. Like there's uh, places in Texas where farmers have quit farming cattle, they're actually farming wind. Yeah. Uh -huh. They've installed all these wind turbines you know, on their property. Now you do have, it's interesting, you've had some people who get upset about the site of wind turbines. Yeah. And I think that's been one thing about putting them out on our coast. But the number one person, it seems, got really, really mad about some wind turbines up in Scotland because they were visible from his golf course. <laughs> And I'll just let you guess who that is. Yeah. <laughs> the Russian funded golf course. And yeah. tried really hard to get the people to take down their wind turbines. Yes. Because he didn't want himself or his uh, patrons of the golf course to have to look at them. Actually, they're quite beautiful. I, look, yeah. I was in Canada so many years ago in the early 90s after my mother died. My sister and I went to see a family there that we hadn't seen for years. And we were driving along in Nova Scotia. And they had these. Beautiful windings out in the water. There, they were beautiful. Yeah. I said, "Oh, look at you know, this is way back then." They, well, they were. And even looking at you know farmhouses back in the old days. Yeah, well, that's you know they farms used to have windmills, and that was how they would get they energy to, to pull their water out of the ground. Yeah. And we were pretty ingenious back when we had to be, and yeah. I think that's one of the things they say distinguishes us from you know, most of the other animals is we can learn how to build tools. We can learn how, I mean, I think even though we won't be able to totally uh, not have climate disruption, I think there's so many things that could be done uh, to to help us not suffer so much and right. to help everybody do better. Well, and Duke Power's dra dragging their feet. Yeah. You know, they're in some other western state where they have um, uh, competition. Right. And they're doing much more. Huh. There, but here they're a monopoly, yeah. and our our uh, government does not really give them too much well, grief about. Just, what just they quickly, want to do. is is it now Duke Power or hasn't it become Progress Energy? It, oh, yeah, well, uh, I it's think Duke it's Energy. A, energy. Oh, it's Duke, Duke energy. energy. Okay, I thought well, there is a Progress yeah. Energy somewhere, which yeah. I think is a pretty uh, interesting name. Right yeah, there. I'm not sure. Yeah, but just uh, one other quick idea that you know one of the other things that we do which is kind of uh, foolish is the um, farmers in Iowa, Indiana, Illinois can grow corn like crazy. Well, we really don't need all that much corn, and this is field corn, in order to feed hogs and pigs, or hogs and chickens, you know, whatever. So they've lobbied very hard with Congress to get subsidies for ethanol. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, the most pumps say contains 10% ethanol. Well, the sad thing there is they use much more energy to plant the seeds, to harvest the corn, and then to turn the corn into ethanol than we get from it. 
So yeah. it's actually an energy, you know, negative mm-hmm. energy kind yeah. of a system. So, you know, we just really, you know, every time we look at something, we can trace back and say, what are the benefits, you know, what are the costs? And even things like, you know, transportation, we all agree, we'd like to have mass transit. You know, well, you can't really put it in right now. Washington, D.C., I think it was in, whenever it was in the 60s, decided to build their metro system, which is wonderful now. But they had to dig down, they had to dig through streets, they had to do so much to get the metro in there. And then, of course, it goes out to all the suburbs, and it's one of the finest, I've been on it quite a few times, it's a very fine transportation system. But if you look, or if you try, you can never get a metro train to Georgetown, because Georgetown fought it. They said, you're not going to come in here and dig up our land Uh, to put in a subway. mm. So we sort of had that problem here in the Triangle. Yeah. I mean, where would we put the kind of trains that you know people would need, yeah. the buses, you know, we try to do it here in Chapel Hill Carborough, but people say, well, there's not a bus at the time I want to go. Tom, I do realize we're having such an interesting conversation, yeah. but our time is just about up. Okay. We've been talking, I should have mentioned your name a couple of times as we're talking, Tom Hoban. Yes. And uh, he's been on before, and we're just delighted that you could come today. Um, this is an ongoing topic. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, we'll have you on again some other time and uh, thank you so much for coming and uh well thank you and it's uh it's good to be able to talk to an audience that i know is actually receptive to this kind of information yes yes definitely good